Good morning and welcome to this week's session of Encompass Live. My name is Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, your usual host, Krista Burns, is stuck in Cleveland at the moment trying to get home from the holidays. Uh, so hopefully she will be back with us next week. Um, I also had a, a, another co-host uh, lined up for me, uh, but she's out sick today. So uh, I'm flying a little solo here. This should be an interesting 45 minutes to an hour this week. Um, because what we're also doing is we're starting sort of a, the plan is a monthly tech talk session with uh, me, uh, Michael Sowers, as uh, kind of your host along with Krista to uh, kind of talk about the tech news of the month, what's going on in libraries, uh, some interviews I've got lined up. In fact, we're going to have one of those today. And the plan is that we will have these pretty much on the last Wednesday of each month as part of the regular Encompass Live. So hopefully you'll enjoy this session. Hopefully we've got all of our uh, technical issues worked out and I can run this software all by myself. So we'll see how it goes. Um, Quick check of something here. Okay, I've got one. Jan can't hear me. Um, there is audio going on. Um, can anybody else not hear me? I just want to, if you can, uh, leave something in the questions, that would be great. I want to make sure that this is going. Um, raise your hand if you can hear me. I think that would be the best way to do this. Okay, so my audio is going out. Um, hopefully Jan will be able to uh, fix her audio problem shortly. Um, but it does look like uh, I am broadcasting, so that's good. Thank you very much. Okay, so my general plan here is I've, you should see on your screen kind of a, a, some bookmarks, uh, things that I kind of plan on talking about today. Um, you know, time allowing, we'll get to as many of these as we can. Um, they're te all technology oriented, but um, they're not really techy techy. They're kind of news, things you might want to pay attention to, um, stories that have been happening that I think uh, might be of interest to you. And what I'm going to start out with is just a little story uh, to introduce uh, our, our kind of special guest today I'm going to be uh, interviewing a fellow librarian. Um, I grew up in Greece, New York, uh, which is a suburb of Rochester, and I grew up at, uh, going to the Monroe County Library System, and I guess it's, it's partially their fault that I became a librarian. Well, as I was surfing around Twitter, um, I found this wonderful little tweet from the Monroe County Library System that said, even Santa needs a GPS. This was back a couple of weeks ago. And it says, Santa can borrow a GPS unit from our science and history division, and so can you. And I, I, I went, wow, there's an idea. I never heard of a library uh, checking out uh, GPS units. And I've also received a few other stories of some other libraries, uh, one here in Nebraska, um, one in Boulder, Colorado, of, of checking out and having some very interesting technology available for their patrons. So what I did was I kind of got on the email, and uh, through a series of emails and a couple of phone calls, I found uh, Jay Osborne, and I'm going to read a little bit of an introduction to him and then uh, uh, ask him a few questions and, and have him tell us about this project of his. Um, but the bio he sent me says, Jay Osborne has been a librarian for over 15 years. He's worked in public libraries and in public and private academic libraries and is currently a librarian in the science division of the Rochester Public Library in Rochester, New York. He considers himself fortunate to be in this position that gives him a surprising amount of freedom to undertake new projects. In the past year, he's been able to uh, do this uh, GPS project, explore creative art spaces in the libraries uh, by circulating an African art exhibit, and launching a book conservation project. He emphasizes that none of these projects even begin without the support of a progressive library administration, to which I will say, hear, hear. When he's not at the library, he can usually be found tinkering with cars, goofing around, and making things out of concrete, or working on his house in suburban Rochester. Uh, hello, Jay, and welcome to Encompass Live. Well, hello to you. <laughs> um, I'll also I don't think I've ever been referred to as a special guest anywhere. I've been referred to as a lot of things, but never a special guest. Hey, you know, first time for everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll add to your uh, working on his house. My, my brother lives in uh, Brockport, New York, another smaller suburb, and he's completely reworking a 150-year-old house um, with his wife and four, child, four, four small children. So uh, I, I'm, yeah. my, that, that one reason I'm glad I'm in Nebraska. 
<laughs> There's no houses that old. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I don't get to help him. So, anyways. Yeah. So, so you guys are checking out GPSs. Um, where where did that idea come from? What's the story behind this? Well, about a little more than a year ago, we got a new director who'd been in the system. Actually, she'd been working in Ogden, which is another suburban library, another town library, as we refer to them here. And uh, she came in and decided that uh, she wanted things to change a little bit to begin changing the public face of the public library. And as a very, you don't get much more bricks and mortar than a library, and in a digital age, that can be a death knell uh, to the next generation of people looking at. Uh, you know, public services and why keep the library if it's so outdated. And in fact, you hear that from administrators across the country. The first thing they want to do is get rid of the library, not fully realizing its economic impact on the community. Uh, not being willing to be thrown in the mix as another institution that can be done away with. Our, li our uh, new director wanted to change our face, as I said, and one of the avenues to doing that was beginning uh, to do things in electronics that other people aren't doing to rather than being a follower trying to push out there and looking realistically at the economic impact of initiating a failed service is fairly small. Uh, a few hundred dollars spent on GPS devices and a few hundred dollars of staff time to try and make the service work she felt was a good risk. She put the idea out there in a, a convocation address and uh, I took up the challenge and she challenged me right back saying get it done within a month. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to say that uh, because uh, she's a new director and uh, everyone had a lot of respect for her, it still does, I shouldn't put that in the past tense, uh, she let it be known that this was a project she was behind and we got it done in six weeks. Wow. Um, yeah. that, that's just impressive. <laughs> Um, well, you know, we've got it, when you've got an organization that's staffed with good people that have some level of trust with each other, you can do a lot. Oh. I think if I'd have been a new hire, it would have been a lot harder for me to push it. But okay. since I'd been here forever, right, <laughs> it was a lot easier for me. Or it just feels like forever? No. Okay. Yeah, um, well, so, well, it does. It's 50. I, I, I realize I've been here over 10 years now. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Great. Um, okay, so you you've been you were given this order. You were you were given a time frame. I'm assuming you were given mm -hmm. some sort of budget, which I guess is probably going to be the, the lead question. A lot of people's minds is you know what was your sure. budget? For this? Absolutely. What beyond the budget? What what is what was the process you actually had to go through to you know pick the equipment, figure out how you're going to circulate it? How did you did you catalog it? What, what what was the process in that six weeks? Well, like I said, I've got a director had that that was pushing the whole project. And uh, she's also been in the system forever. She's been a lifetime employee practically here uh, in the county system. We're a, we're a municipal system, and she actually is the county director, which core, uh, which kind of, um, how would you say, uh, choreographs different activities within the county. That in some ways we all participate in certain collected services like book delivery, and we used to do a lot more, but that's waning somewhat. But the bottom line is she's in charge of the larger unit, the umbrella organization. I actually work for one of the subunits. Mm -hmm. So the advantage that I had was she has a lot of weight here. And uh, she also knows all the key players in here. So she went down through this checklist of people for me to contact and cataloging and uh, the technical people who would have to make up a new media code and all that. And as we're sitting there talking to her about this, it occurred to us that, well, the dumb thing to do would be to set this up for just GPS devices. And a big recommendation I can make to anybody contemplating this sort of thing, whether it's GPS devices or whatever, is that you look at your media codes, you look at how you're going to set all these processes and all these negotiations with your cataloging department as not, it, 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 with keeping them, all those things as plastic as possible. So you can do things like a Kindle. So you can mm -hmm. do things like a different kind of GPS device. So it's not all narrowed down to this one kind of device that does one particular thing. Because realistically, we're all about service provision. This is just another service we're providing. And keeping everything in line with that as a goal as opposed to making this one service work, you're going to be way ahead. Right. Does that address your question a little bit there? Sure. Okay. The money so, one is easy. Yeah. So, so what sort of budget did you have? Or, or let me, let me what, what budget were you given? What did you end up spending on these devices? <laughs> I'm a cheap guy. I'll be the first to admit that I don't like spending a lot of money. This works well in this organization. Okay. And what I was able to do was find uh, the 
older versions of what well, we, we went with the TomTom. -tom. We could have gone with Garmin. Could have gone with anyone. Um, but we found an older unit that was just past its uh, being the premier instrument. And um, I got those for about $133 a piece. Okay, through, wow. I think the vendor was Amazon. Okay, all right, great. And, and our, you know, you know, what are you going to do? You can buy them used because after they go out the first time, they're used anyway. Right. If you're giving a gift, maybe you wouldn't buy a refurb, but one of ours was supposed to be new and it came as a refurb anyway. So there's more ways to save money than just going older. You can get one that's actually used. And it came from Amazon. And I recommend a quality vendor like that because they actually, you know, came up with the, all the right parts and pieces were in it. So mm -hmm. it worked out well for us. Um, the second set we bought, we first initially bought three. Okay. And they came in overnight, and uh, that was fantastic. After the service was up and running, after a few weeks, we bought three more. And those had to go through the city contract, and that took about four and a half, five weeks to come in. Okay. And so that, that sort of thing, if you have the ability, if, you have, if your library has a credit card, has an account with Amazon, and you can find a way to argue that this is actually library supplies as opposed to some sort of... I, I'm not a budget guy, so I don't know how those things are configured in different libraries, but there's different sorts of budget lines. That was the big challenge, actually, was figuring out how to get it out of the right budget line. Yeah, I've been here three years, and I'm still trying to figure out how we buy stuff to the state. So. <laughs> 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 I, can, I can relate to that one. Uh, you know, yeah. is, is it equipment? Is it a purchase? Is it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so what has been the uh, – uh, the, Patron reaction. I, I, well, okay. Let me let me rephrase. How how have you been letting people know? I've got. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got your even Santa needs a GPS page for, from the website up here with a okay. little video, which I'll, I'll I've pointed people to and they can look at. But beyond yeah. this page, how how have you marketed this? How have you told people that these things exist in the library for them to, to check out? Well, it, it, fortunately for us, uh, we've got a pretty well-developed web presence, and we do get a fair amount of information out through that media. Uh, there was, at some point, supposed to be a press release. I personally can't remember right offhand whether or not that happened, because the person in our communications department that was supposed to oversee that was out sick for a number of weeks. Ah, so okay. I can't remember when or where or, or, sadly, even if that actually happened, it may have uh, taken a back seat to other initiatives at the time that she came back. Okay. But uh, those are all ways that we, we pursue generally. You know, we have a fairly good relationship with the newspapers and the media in our town, so we're, we're pretty well connected mm -hmm. with that, so we can use that media. Uh, okay. But I think the video was, was the, one of the most interesting things that came out of it. Okay. And there's another one coming that's way funnier. I okay, all right. Uh, I, I will definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, and and I, I know a little something, you know, having grown up with it, with, with, with the library system and, and – I, here in Nebraska, we really only have two libraries uh, uh, we, of, of size, shall we say. We have a lot of mm -hmm. rural libraries, whatever. But are, are your units all at the central library and then available to be checked out, you know, transferred to another branch, or do they have to get it from the central branch in your case? Right. That's a, that's a really good point. For us, uh, part of the negotiations uh, with each individual, shall we say, stakeholder in our administration uh, was that we would we would – lend them directly from the science division. We didn't want to make anyone else responsible for transmitting these things. These are one of the most high, most uh, stolen items out of people's cars. Uh, <laughs> people will smash a window just to grab this because you can sell it for an easy 25, 50 bucks on the corner. Good buck. They're Good completely non-traceable. And, and we didn't really want those going through delivering, have the one turn up missing, and then, well, did the patron get it? back to us, did someone, who, whose responsibility? We took all that out of the loop, and they just go through the science division. We do okay. the, the circulation on them ourselves, which creates other problems depending on the sophistication of your, you know, your OPEC. I mean, ours is not real good, so our circulation module is pretty clunky. Okay. So there's challenges involved in that. I, I remember the old Carl system, so that's... <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Are you still on yeah, that? Yeah, well, you know... <laughs> they're they're the cheap one on the market, so and they do their job. They you know, but uh, it is it is some frustrations sure. working on the back end. Yeah. So so what what has been? Um, I'm not exactly sure. That when did you get them in, and what's what what sort of patron reaction circulation numbers have you been getting with these? Well, the we've had uh, at least half of them have been in constant circulation. Great. And we first got them up and running. I'm going to guess now, probably sometime in May or June. We got them oh, okay. up and running. 
Okay. Um, the first units were in constant circulation. We had them at three-week loan period initially to treat them like books. And again, that was with the idea of we're not doing GPSs, we are doing an electronic device. Do sure. we discriminate between electronic devices and other and books? And we wanted to say no. We want them all to be the same. In practical terms, that's not workable for these. That's just just too it's too long. We had we had a list of 14 or 15 people at one point uh, waiting to get their hands on a GPS. So we bought more devices, lowered the loan period, and it's a lot more reasonable now. We rarely have more than three or four people on the waiting list at any time. So so what is the loan period now? Two. Two weeks. Okay, two weeks. so you shortened it to two weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Are are you finding that people are getting them because they can? They're planning a trip and they're taking it with them. What have you got an idea of what the the use of them is once they have them? Well, I I know that several people come to us saying I want to try a GPS. Never tried one. Thinking about it, and some of these people might be using Navigator service on their phone through mm -hmm. Verizon or another service, and they just want to see what this other device works like, or they have a Garmin, they're thinking about going to a TomTom. -tom. We went with just TomToms just because it simplifies our lives, just sticking with one brand so that I only have one set of menus I have to describe over the phone. <laughs> uh, which, you know, when you support something like this, and that's another consideration, you want to make sure you have at least a couple people on your staff that have actually used these devices. Mm -hmm. And if they, you know, since it's all through the science division, we've got far four or five people here. Uh, everybody's used them. Several of us have them. So it was just easier that way. Um, but some people use them because they're thinking of buying a TomTom -tom or they're buying some sort of GPS device, uh, or they just want to use one for one trip. Oh, great. And see if it's worth their time. Yeah, Yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I hadn't even thought about just checking one out just to try it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, like, well, that, that's a great idea. Walmart won't let you do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you get to try it when you leave. Yeah, that's and, been and, really helpful. Yeah, I bet. And you know, returning to, to Amazon isn't even always the most you know convenient uh, thing in the world. Um, I'm just right. going inter to interrupt here real quick. Um, if anybody has any questions for Jay, please feel free to start typing them into the questions area, and and I will I will read them back to him for uh, since a he's on the phone, b uh, for the benefit of the recording, because I just have one or two more things I want to ask him. Um, are has there been any problems with it? Any any like difficulties you didn't expect, unforeseen circumstances, or has it all been completely smooth, no problems whatsoever? Are you kidding me? I planned this. <laughs> it worked out perfectly. <laughs> what are you talking about problems? Yeah, we ran into a couple issues. Uh, one was that we didn't have the foresight to buy a second case in case somebody lost the case or lost a cable. Oh. Well, duh. <laughs> you know that that. Yeah, I guess that would be an issue. So, uh, and so of that, course, that's we haven't. Happened. It has not happened yet that we've lost one, but it just oh. it just turns out that you know, well, good God, what what were we thinking? <laughs> we didn't provide uh, backups for these things. Uh, another situation we had, which was actually pretty funny and actually, actually you know, pretty entertaining for for me personally, uh, I spent 40 minutes on the phone with a lady who swore up and down she'd return her charger. And it turns out it's identical to the Motorola charger for her Verizon phone. Oops. <laughs> and as I'm describing the charger to it, she says, yeah, they, yeah, they have a white tag. Yeah, I know I returned it. That's right here. Oh, she had it in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was a little bit, it was, you know, it was a challenging uh, public service moment for me. Um, <laughs> but it was fun. I enjoyed it. You know. So really, no, there are, there's almost no downside from our perspective. Um, you got to have a, pl a secure place to keep it at the desk. That's mm -hmm. an issue. But no, it's been really positive. In fact, uh, we're, we've spawned some other interests uh, in other divisions. And this, the art division, which does recreation, uh, is actually looking at um, getting the GPS devices for geocaching. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little cheap Garmin for 140 bucks. Surprisingly more expensive than the one that your life might depend on. Of course, they, I guess if you're geocaching in the Alps, it's, it's a different issue. But uh, Typically, we don't think of geocaching as more than a sport, but actually, these can be used for a lot of a lot of helpful things. Um, and Kindles are next on our agenda. You know, now okay. that we've got this done, we're we're going to see if we can find a way to wheedle our way into providing Kindles. And 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 if the license agreement even allows you to. But that's <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that, that's that, a big issue. That that's a different phone call. <laughs>
Yeah, that is. That's good. With, yeah, after I have my my interview with the Department of Justice. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, let let me let me know how that goes, and maybe we'll talk again. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll okay. get you some connections over there. Yeah. Um, okay. I've got a couple of questions uh, from our audience here. Uh, the first one says, um, "It says on the website that you require a credit card," which I I had been meaning to ask right. about. Uh, do you have any right. problems with patrons wanting to check out and they don't have a credit card? Um, no, because even a debit card, anything will work. Most everybody has a debit card. And, and in mm -hmm. truth, the the credit card, again, I mentioned I had to pass this whole uh, whole set of policies through several people. And the credit card thing was one thing that everybody wanted. Well, we got to get the credit card numbers. We can't lose these things. Well, they're 150 bucks. We, we, we have service manuals for cars. For domestic, and they're four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't ask a credit card for those. I mean, in realistic terms, a hundred dollars. Well, you know, some libraries are not in our position, right. where they they don't have a commitment to buying uh, expensive resources and then lending them out for free. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, it's, it's, you think about it. The philosophy of what we do for a living is absurd, but this is what we do, and and it's a mm -hmm. great service. Uh, but we have never had a problem with someone refusing to or having available some sort of piece of plastic we could run through the paper, the, the old-fashioned uh, carbon copy thing. Uh -huh. We do not go online with the card. We, that's, that's really not what it's about. Right. This is actually almost as much about satisfying internal concerns as it was making sure we have resource. Right. So you're, you're, not, putting a hold, yeah, you're not putting a hold on the credit card yeah. or anything. This is just, just in case the device doesn't get returned or gets lost or whatever. You can right. charge. The, I, you you would theoretically charge them for it if it didn't get returned or got lost or stolen or. Yeah, theoretically yeah. we would. Um, we would we would do that. What we would probably do is, it's this is where it gets confusing. I mean, do you bill them for a new one? Well, it wasn't new when they got it. They would probably be billed for around eighty bucks. Okay. The cost of a replacement through Amazon. Sure. Fair enough. For a used used unit, yeah. Okay. Um, one of my other two questions we have here is, uh, do you know of any situations where uh, a group has checked it out, like, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, something like that, or has it mostly been individuals and families? To my knowledge, it's mostly been individuals. Um, we have no idea what that individual does with it when they leave. True. However, I anticipate that there'll be more of that sort of activity when we do the, the um, geocaching type GPSs. Now, the GPS units we have are, are not the expensive ones that you can go off-road with. Right. These are just right. highway maps and a GPS gotcha. locator that gives you a point on the map and an agenda. Uh, right. The others are, are a little different, and I expect that we might see that, but I don't think we would ever know what anyone's doing with it. Okay. And, and our, our last question from the audience is, um, can, can you echo back any specific comments you've gotten from the patrons about, you know, you know, gee, I'm glad you got these, or, you know, I tried it and didn't work well, or, or any, any specific comments you've gotten back that you can share? Well, one specific comment was, um, I love the menu system. Another was, I hate the menu system. <laughs> uh, why does it keep taking me off-road when I want to be, if he did not want to take the highway. Well, he didn't change the preferences to say I don't want to go on the highway. Mm -hmm. uh, he, another person said, it kept talking to me and it broke my concentration. One person found that she just couldn't drive with the thing yapping at her. I'll tell you, I, I took a trip with a girl down to New York City, and the car I rented had a Garmin in it, and she was fiddling with the Tom Tom. She had them all set to female voices, and so I had three women telling me how to, you know, get down there. It, it was an, it was an amazing thing. I can really sympathize with with people that get distracted by that because I couldn't tell whose voice was who half the time. Right. And uh, you know, there's only one of them I'm really going to pay attention to. Uh, but it was it was an interesting thing uh, that uh, you can actually have too much data coming in. Yeah, good point. Um, I guess the last question I have, which just just kind of popped into my head, I'm I'm assuming these units yeah. need to be um, updated somewhat regularly, um, maps, that sort of thing. That's something you guys are handling all behind the scenes. Then well, actually, we we are uh, studiously avoiding that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we're trying not to get too involved in that. We bought current units. The expectation is that these have a lifespan. We're actually, to be honest with you, stunned we still have six of them. Okay. Our assumption was it would be like buying uh, books that end up getting be weeded by you know the patrons, essentially, uh -huh. through loss, theft, or destruction. 
and none of that's happened. So uh, I guess that we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. We've not yet had them in service for a year yet. Um, well, I, I'm not I, sure how that's going to work out for us. Well, I was thinking more like software updates. Right, the, right. The, the map data. Oh, I agree. And, and you've just... Yeah, they, they keep, they're just as they are the day you got them and they're working? Yes. Okay. Yes, we had to log into TomTom's Tom site and register them so that they are ours, and they see our organization as the owner. Therefore, no one else can go on and update the maps on their own. Oh, okay. Because they okay. have to have our logins. Um, gotcha. We, we haven't gone into that yet. And like I said, we were not really thinking that we would even have them. We, we just assumed we'd be buying new units every 18 months or so which is a significant expense, and not every library could possibly do that. So, of course, you're right. going to be talking to someone six months from now, hopefully, from one of the other libraries. And I, and I have to say real quick that I, I, before I started this, I called the Mann Library down in Cornell. They've lent out GPS units of the geocaching type, talked to them for a little bit. I talked to, I believe, that library in Colorado. And, uh, yeah, this is something that libraries are going to be doing more of, I suspect. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, we've got then again, we may get leapfrogged with technology on cell phones. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a new droid, and uh, it's gotten me unlost a couple of times already. So um, I'm, 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 I see these things aren't necessarily for everyone. These are these are devices that might long term have, as these functions merge, onto cell phones. Which ultimately, who wants to carry two devices? Ultimately, the right. Kindle's going to go away too, and we're going to have you know one device that's all science fictiony at this point. But it's the logical progression. Right. Uh, these are the tools that we find the people that really are really happy to have them available are um, people just start now trying to figure out if they want to buy one or not, but also, you know, grandparents going to see the kids for Christmas. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they're the ones that really find a real value in it. Yep. My, 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 my parents, uh, now both retired, do the, uh, you know, day trips and weekend trips all the time, and they still use the paper maps, and they don't even own a cell mm -hmm. phone. And um, um, my brother and I are kind of like, you guys, um, you know, you, you might want to... <laughs> get something um, but well here's a little heads up uh, I'm in the same situation I had to buy my dad a cell phone show him how to use it and I handed him the TomTom -tom, and he's all over that he's oh. he's a technical guy from years back he worked for right. you know NASA contractors and yeah he well, loves it so n neither of my parents are technophobes we skyped on Christmas Day this year so you know but it's just they, they don't see the need for it and they, one day they will so you know right. there you go um, is there anything else uh, you'd like to tell us that maybe I didn't ask about, or, or do you think uh, libraries should know if they're considering doing something like this? Um, no, not really. I mean, well, in my conversation with the library in Colorado, uh, that's one of the things that just said gave me the full green light on this. Uh, small library, I think there's like two, two or three people. The impression I had was like this very small staff. And... She's, you know, I said, well, what are you worried about losing it? It's a big hunk of your budget. If you lose it, she said, well, yeah, but it's a small town, and people are basically honest. And it's a $25 deposit. If we lose one, well, we lose one. And I might be oversimplifying her attitude. She was incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that you got to take a step back and look at the price. What's, what's 150 bucks? I right. mean, that's, that's three or four novels. But if this is undertaken as a view of changing how people see you. And remember, the outset of the conversation, that's what it's about. It's about changing the face of the library, changing the internal right. politics of the library. And mm -hmm. it's a device for all of those things. It's tremendously successful. The final result to the patron is they get a service they didn't otherwise have. Yeah, and you know, and if they're happy... It's all the way around, everybody wins. Right, and if they're happy with that service, they might uh, vote for that mill levy increase next time around. So... <laughs> Well, you know, library districting is always an option for us. You yeah, know, I mean, or, or when it, new however, ways. Yeah, however the funding comes from, they, you know, if right, happy, right. They they might go. Well, yeah, you know, I do get stuff out of the library. Yep. Yeah, I'll yep. just mention um, just some of the other things that I, the Boulder Public Library, who I'm I'm trying to get on the phone, is is uh, circulating um, power meters that you plug in your wall, plug the devices into, right. tell you how much power uh, those things are actually using. And then we just got a, um, a very small library here in Nebraska who I will be talking to next month um, who has one of those photo printing kiosks uh, in their library mm -hmm. now and because the closest one was 30 miles away from town. Uh, so, yeah, the libraries are really starting to look at new things, new technologies as services to patrons um, as opposed to just the books and the magazines as we're used to. So. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, Jay, I want to thank you very much for doing this. It was kind of, you know, somewhat short notice, and um, I, I want to say this went phenomenally well for my first time doing an interview over the Internet. <laughs> well, uh, you did a quality job from my perspective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so, Jay, I'll, I'll let you uh, go get back to work, uh, or you're welcome to, to, to hang out for the next half hour uh, when I cover the other stories. But, again, I just want to uh, thank you for doing this. Well, I appreciate it. I do have uh, some things I have to attend to, and uh, again, thank you, and uh, I hope this goes well, and you're able to use the interview uh, in your uh, podcast. Yeah, we will do. Thanks a lot. All right. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right. Hey, I, you know, I don't know about uh, the, the rest of you on the line, but I, I think that is just an amazing idea. Um, a, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be talking to, I, I believe it's Beaver City uh, next month. If I got that wrong, I apologize. I don't have that note in front of me. Um, their, uh, their director is scheduled to talk to me next month uh, during Tech Talk about their photo printing service. And uh, I am also still working on getting someone from Boulder Public uh, possibly on the line in, in maybe February, excuse me, to talk about their um, similar to this, but not GPS, uh, but uh, uh, power meter units. Um, so, you know, and, and any of you listening have any other ideas, if your library is doing something interesting, um, forward thinking, or you know of another library, you know, drop me an email, let me know. Um, I can be contacted through the, the Library Commission's website, and I'll see if I can get them uh, on the phone or over the Internet and talk to them and, and share their story also. So I do have a few other things I just kind of want to uh, throw out and talk about off of my list. Uh, excuse me here, I'm working on my site. And this, I'm thinking this might take 10 or 15 more minutes. Uh, I don't think I'll keep you for the whole hour here. Um, but uh, just a, a few other stories that have kind of come across my desk in the last couple of weeks uh, that I thought if you haven't seen, you might be interested in seeing and um, knowing about. One is a service that I just learned about uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, this is called Backupify. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is an online service that will back up your other online services. I think I, I, I'm very intrigued by this. I have literally 25,000 photos on my Flickr account. Uh, now, I do also have all those on my hard drive and backed up to DVD, uh, but I also have a delicious account and a Twitter account, and Facebook account, and um, a blogger account with several blogs running in there, and a lot of this stuff lives online. I don't have a backup of this. Right? Uh, I don't have it on my hard drive, and in many cases, there isn't necessarily a way to easily download this content. Backupify will do that. and so what it will do is you sign up, you tell it what services you use, you allow Backupify to access those services, and then they will make secure backups of that content, which you can then get back later. Should, say, your Twitter account blow up, you can get all your tweets back. Now, maybe not the best example, you know, who puts anything important on Twitter. But Let's say you store all your bookmarks in Delicious, or you've written all these wonderful essays in Blogger, and you want to get those back should those services ever blow up or accidentally delete your account, or you accidentally delete your account. You can do that. The reason I'm pointing this out is if you sign up with Backupify between now and the end of January, it's free, and it will be free forever. Now, forever as long as the service stays around, but it works. And it will, you can even get uh, daily reports of what it's backed up, it's wonderful. I've been using it for about a week and a half now. Seems to be doing the job quite well. I think it's stable enough that it's something I can recommend. So if you're storing a lot of content online, you want to make uh, backup copies of that content, uh, check, up, uh, check out uh, backupify.com and get signed up soon uh, because it's free through the end of January. And no, this is not a sponsored advertisement. I just found out about it, and I think it's a cool service. Go back to my list here pull up one of these other stories. Um, some of these I bookmarks and I'm thinking, well, maybe I won't talk about them. So let me pull up this one. This was an interesting story. Um, turns out, how many of you have had the password talk? Okay, I, I don't want to have this talk again. I've had it in previous sessions. I'll do it in future sessions. But really the point is, is that you got to pick a good password. 
The word password is not a good password. One, two, three, four, five, six is not a good password. Well, it turns out somebody did a little digging in the code behind the Twitter sign-up page, and they actually have a list of 370 passwords you are not allowed to use as your Twitter password. And if you try it, it will say, we're sorry, you can't do that. Um, this page here kind of gives you a, a, a brief uh, instructions as to how to find that complete list if you want. But uh, there's a list of just some of the passwords that are not allowed, uh, such as password, testing, Twitter, uh, please. I, I, I find it amusing that Beavis and Butthead are not allowed passwords on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, there you go. And Laura, thank you for letting me know that you've had the password talk. Uh, you know, if you, you hear it enough, you end up starting to give that talk to other people. Um, so I just found this was just a neat little news story, something you can check out. Uh, maybe pull up that list for yourself, take a look at it, and see if you're using that password on any other of your services. You know, is your password a good one or a bad one? Chances are if it's on this list, Twitter at least does think that it is a, a bad password. And I will just highlight here, you can download a text file of all 370 banned passwords for Twitter. For um, Twitter. <clears throat> okay, back to my list here. Um, another news story I found very interesting, and then I've, I've talked to a whole bunch of other people about it, and um, something that maybe you've seen this story. And this story was that on Christmas Day, Kindle books outsold real books on uh, Amazon. Okay. Now, there was another story that said the most, the, the most gifted item on Amazon this year was a Kindle. Okay, that I find pretty cool. You look at this headline, and immediately most people are impressed. You're thinking, wow, Kindle books. Man, more people bought electronic books Christmas Day from Amazon than real books. Okay. Well, I posted this to Twitter. I thought about it a little bit. Some of my colleagues kind of tweeted back and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, let's, let's not get too excited about this. And, and I've linked to some of those other blog posts from some of my colleagues about this. And they said, well, first of all, Amazon didn't release any numbers. So for all we know, they sold 15 electronic books and 14 print books on Christmas Day. Now, not likely, but they didn't exactly say that they sold, you know, 20 times the number of electronic vers books versus print books. They just said they sold more electronic books than print books. The other thing you want to think about is, let's say you got a Kindle for Christmas. Okay? You wake it up in the morning, you open it up under the tree, it's all there, you get a Kindle. Um, how useful is that Kindle without any content? So what are you going to do? you're going to immediately start buying books for your Kindle. And, you know, if you're somebody who gets a Kindle, chances are you're going to buy more than one. So let's say instead you wake up Christmas morning, you open your presents, and you got an Amazon gift card. Okay? You're going to immediately jump up and run to the computer and go buy some books? Probably not. So, although I'll admit I would, <laughs> but nobody got me Amazon this year. So... <clears throat> Yes, I think this is important. Yes, I think ebooks are really starting to catch on and more and more use and more and more use. I still buy print books. I do buy a few electronic books myself. I have the original version of the Sony Reader. But don't let this headline, in my opinion and the opinion of a few others, make you think that, like we just hit this sudden turning point in electronic books. Um, yes, they may have sold more that year, but if you really kind of think about it, you know, maybe it isn't that big of a deal. No, just something to think about, and I will leave you with that. Okay, let me just do uh, one or two other stories here. Um, and I will, let's see, let's throw in this one, because this one's got eight points. This is eight things every geek needs to do before 2010. Now, I found this last week, and unfortunately we got, what, two days left? So, you know, you better get on this list. But anyways, maybe not immediately before 2010, but it's kind of one of these end-of-the-year reminders of things you should probably do if you're a computer user. Now, this assumes I can actually get this page to come up. Okay, here we go. So let's run through this list and um, 
think about each of these for a minute. Okay, number one, edit your privacy settings and friendships. Okay, you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you're on MySpace. You know, how many of those people you follow are actually your friends? How many have you gotten to know? Maybe it's time to weed the friends list. Maybe you really don't need to follow 300 people in Facebook. Okay, if you know 300 people, great. But if you don't, yeah, maybe some of those people you can go, well, you know, they follow me, I follow back, I really don't know who they are, I really don't care what they have to say, so maybe I can weed them out. The other one is check your privacy settings in these systems. One of the art other articles I've linked to is a Facebook recently made some settings to their private, excuse me, made some changes to their privacy settings. And a lot of stuff that uh, defaulted to private before actually does uh, now uh, defaults public, so you might want to check that stuff out. Um, Laura, I do see your hand raised, um, but I don't, s and let me check my questions area here. I don't see something there, so I'm assuming you are on audio, so give me a sec here. Um, Laura, I've unmuted you. Do you have a question or a comment? Okay, I'm going to guess no. And go ahead and uh, finish through this list. Change your passwords. Okay. I, here's my opinion on this one. If you've picked good passwords in the first place, chances are you don't need to change them. But <clears throat> as we've already kind of talked about, if you don't have very good passwords, now is a good time to change them. <sighs> Own your name. This could be kind of uh, just a, a session in and of itself, but... You know, do a Google search on yourself. See what's out there. Um, do, uh, you know, are you consistently using your name um, across your different services? I'm generally known as M. Sowers across Twitter and Facebook and MySpace, either M. Sowers or Travel and Librarian. I'm not 100% consistent, but at least I've narrowed it down to two. And usually they're pretty well cross-referenced. Prune your feeds. Right, for those of you who are uh, RSS readers, as I am, now is a good time to go ahead and check all that stuff you're subscribed to and maybe weed out the things that you don't watch anymore. Uh, I actually did this last night at home with video feeds that I watch on the computer connected to my television. And I went through it. I'm like, you know what? I never watch that show anymore. I never watch that show anymore. And I, oh, I do still watch this show, and I don't watch that show. And I unsubscribe from a whole bunch of stuff. You know, now is kind of a good chance to do that. Um, find a better mobile uh, or a cell phone as we call them here in the States. Uh, this assumes you have the cash and your contract is up. So we'll just kind of you know skip over that one real quick. Um, update copyright notices on your website. Okay. How many of them say copyright 1999 through 2002? Go ahead, check. See if you need to change those copyright statements to 2010. Um, if you have a blog, are you paying attention to it? Oh yeah, I do have a blog. In fact, just from somebody in Nebraska this morning, I read a post that said, I just realized I haven't posted to my blog in six months. I keep meaning to do that. I'm, this is my New Year's resolution. I'm going to try to post to my blog more. So, you know, give it a shot. Have you been ignoring your blog? And number eight, back up your data. We already talked about Backupify. There are other services out there. <clears throat> for backing up other content. Um, again, completely unasked for, I use a service called Backblaze, B-A-C-K-B-L-A-Z-E. Um, I pay them five bucks a month and I get unlimited online backup. So it just, everything I've set on my computer, all of my documents, all of my pictures, all of my videos, just constantly get backed up to the internet. And for five bucks a month, I can give them as much content as I want. In fact, it's taken three months and it's still running the first backup of everything on my computer. I've got so much on this beast. <clears throat> but for five bucks a month, I know most of my data is backed up somewhere so that not only if my computer crashes, but if my house burns down, all of my photos, all of my documents, all of my tax returns, all that computer data is I can get onto another computer and download all that content back. In fact, if I pay them a little extra, they'll even burn all that data to a DVD and mail it to me. Okay. So back up your data, back up your data, and oh, by the way, did I mention back up your data? Okay, 
I think those are the uh, stories I think I'm just going to cover for this, uh, this month. Um, the, I will go back to this bookmarks page. Uh, we will, as um, part of the recording and the emails that go out afterwards, uh, link you back to this page. But for reference, you can find these bookmarks at delicious.com slash travel in librarian slash tech talk plus DEC as in December 09. So tech talk plus DEC 09 or 09. And you can find links to the stories I've talked about, a few other related links, one or two stories that I just decided not to cover in too much detail. And um, we do have 10 minutes left. And one of the things we did want to do in this session is um, allow people to kind of uh, play a game I used to like to call Stump the Trainer. Um, but do you have any questions for me? Anything I talked about? Any other tech questions? Um, you know, now's your chance, although you can always call me. You can always send me an email. Um, but uh, if there's anything you want to ask, uh, I'll give you the opportunity. You can either do a hand raise if you've got a mic going on, or you can go ahead and type it into the questions area, and I will do my best. Um, while we're giving people a chance to do that, I will quickly point out one other website here that I have on my list. Um, and this is uh, the folks at Gizmodo went back, and they took a look at their hot tech items you should buy from the year 2000. And this list is spectacular. I love some of this stuff. Um, I mean, this, this is an MP3 player at number one here. Um, this is the PS2 video game down here. I mean, there's, it, it, this is the hot smart cell phone going on. If, if you just want a 10-year-old, because it's the end of the decade, depending on who you ask, uh, kind of review of what the hot tech was in the year 2000, I, I think this is a really great little list to kind of go through and take a look at. Okay, um, we're done a little early, but I don't see any questions sitting in the question queue or any hands raised for audio questions. So I'm going to go ahead and say thank you all for attending this uh, Encompass Live session and this first of what I hope will be many uh, Tech Talk sessions. Uh, like I said, I have at least an interview uh, set up for January, and I will have more stories for you. And I think we will call it a morning. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.